Welcome back, everyone. So we're to chapter three now. So in chapter two, we talked some about neurons and we talked about um, even structures of the brain. So it's gone to some gross anatomy. Uh, this time we're kind of step, taking a step back. We're going to look more on a smaller scale. We're going to look at what actually happens within a neuron. We're going to look at how neurons fire and um, start learning a little bit about neurotransmitters, which will certainly be um, building upon throughout the semester, but just starting to get that knowledge. So today we're going to be talking about neurophysiology, which is the study of the life processes within neurons. And we're going to talk about the electrical and chemical signals that are used within neurons. So up, at, up to this point, uh, we've talked some about the form of neurons, so we've talked about their shape, their type, um, structures within the neuron. Now we're going to turn our attention to their function. How do these neurons communicate? Um, how, how is it that these chemical or electrical signals get passed? We'll be discussing all that in this chapter. So one of the main topics we're going to dis discuss today is the action potential which the action potential is a rapid electrical signal that travels along the axon of a neuron. So note here that it's an electrical signal of communication. It's electrical signal, not chemical. Um, and also that this actually happens um, along the neuron. So with this, it actually happens within. So when you think of electrical communication, think of within the neuron, because as you'll see, the chemical is more outside the neuron. Um, so as I mentioned, there's also a chemical component. So this comes into play when the neuron needs to communicate with other neurons. And neurons use chemicals that we call neurotransmitters. And these are just chemical messengers that communicate between the neurons. So thus, when you think of communication between neurons, think chemical within think electrical. So as we mentioned, messages are sent within the cell through electrical transmission. To understand this transmission, one must first understand the resting potential of the neuron. So the first thing to know is that there are ions. Ions are electrically charged molecules that are both within and outside the neuron. Um, anions are negatively charged, whereas cations are positively charged. So they're just molecules that have electrical charges. Um, in the intracellular fluid, which is the fluid that's um, within the cell, um, it's separated from the extracellular fluid, which is the fluid outside the cell, by a cell membrane. So this enables the intracellular fluid to be a different charge than the extracellular fluid. And yes, as you'll see, this becomes very important with the firing of the neuron. Um, at rest, a neuron's charge or resting potential is actually between 50 and 80 millivolts. That's going to be really important to know. 50 and 80 millivolts. Uh, this means that the, the cell is actually natively charged at rest, whereas the extracellular fluid is roughly neutral. Um, some of this is actually due to, within the cell, there are um, large protein anions that can't exit the cell. And that's part of the reason why the cell actually has a negative charge at rest. So the cell membrane um, is actually made of a lipid bilayer, which can, you can see in the picture, um, these circles that have tails that are pointing towards each other. This is the lipid bilayer. Um, it's a membrane that keeps what is in, in, and what is out, out. As you guys may know, lipids, you know, anytime you have a fat that just admits with liquid, uh, they, they repel. So that's part of the reason why it's able to separate. Since these are lipids, they're fats, they help hold that out. The um, liquid can't permeate through it. However, there are these ion channels um, that allow certain types of ions into the cell. So some of the ion channels are gated, 
like those in the picture here, meaning that they can open and close. So if something triggers them, they can open and then they close afterwards. Um, other channels, other ion channels are open all the time. Um, many of these channels allow only potassium. Potassium is a um, positive ion, a positively charged ion, to cross, meaning that the cell membrane is selectively permeable to potassium item, ions. So potassium can get in and out, but other things can't as easily. So just keep that in mind. So one thing you may wonder, potassium is positive. It can cross the cell membrane at will, and the cell is negatively charged. So why isn't there potassium going into the cell until it becomes neutral? Well, um, we are about to talk about that. So first, let's take a step back and talk about the different forces that are at play. So I already kind of hinted at this. So there are two forces at play, diffusion and electrostatic pressure. Diffusion occurs when a high concentration of an element moves towards an area of low concentration. So for example, think of a drop of food coloring that you put in a glass of water. Or um, an example that I always think of um, is actually when I was young, uh, I was a swimmer. I was actually a swimmer all through high school. And what we used to do at the end of swim meets, uh, the adults didn't really like this, but someone would go buy a bunch of Kool-Aid and we'd um, put the Kool-Aid in our swimsuits. And with that, everyone had a different color of Kool-Aid. So it ended up, one lane ended up being red, one orange, one yellow. It looked really cool, but eventually it all became like one big purple pool. Um, so why does that happen? Well, what diffusion is, is if you put something like Kool-Aid or a drop of um, food coloring into water, there's going to be a movement of the molecules where it's going to diffuse. So it's going to go from being highly concentrated toward being less concentrated. So that's why over time, if you just put in one drop of watercolor into water, eventually that whole glass of water is going to be the same color. So it helps. Um, the concentration gradient makes it so eventually it's evenly distributed, which is why the pool eventually became purple. Electrostatic pressure, on the other hand, causes ions to move based on the charge of the ion. So ions with the same charge will repel each other, whereas those with the opposite charge are attracted to each other. So thus, positively charged potassium cations are attracted toward the cell, um, and they're likely to enter the cell rather than remaining in the extracellular fluid. So this is just another picture here. So. You have the diffusion on the top, um, so you can see where we're going, where we're more concentrated, it's going to move to where it's less concentrated. And then you also have the electrostatic forces at play, which, um, as you can see, repel similars and unite different charges. So given that potassium cations are drawn to come into the cell, and the fact that since many of the ion channels allow them free passage, why does the cell remain negative? Well, the answer is actually the potassium, sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump, for every two potassium cations that come into the cell, it will remove three sodium ions. So, okay, so did that in your head. So potassium is coming into the cell, and for every potassium that's positive that comes in, it's removing, or every two, it's removing three positive sodium ions. So that's one way it's reducing the charge, is by removing more with the sodium than it's coming in. But keep in mind here that um, 
you also now have a lot of potassium in the cell. So this affects that concentration gradient. So at rest, potassium ions move into the negative interior of the cell because of that electrostatic pressure. But after a while, there gets to be so many potassium ions in the cell that they want to diffuse out because of the concentration gradient. So it actually reaches the point where the concentration gradient is enough pressure pushing them out of the cell that it offsets the electrostatic pressure pulling them into the cell. And that happens right around that 50 to 80 millivolts. So that is why the cell has a negative charge. It's because with that um, sodium potassium pump, it results in there being more potassium in the cell and the concentration gradient balances out the electrostatic pressure. Make sense? Okay. So, as I was just mentioning, you have this equilibrium where the movement out is balanced by the movement in. And it's because of that um, electrostatic pressure being equaled by the concentration gradient. And again, it happens anywhere between 50 and 80 millivolts. Just an average is 60, so we'll say 60 for the purpose of our examples, but it's anywhere between 50 and 80 depending. So as we'll soon see, an action potential is a brief but a very large change in the, um, in the charge of the neuron. So they originate at the axon hillock, which we've talked about a little bit, and they propagate down the axon. In order to understand the process, it's really important to understand hyperpolarization and depolarization. Hyperpolarization is when the neuron gets even more negative than normal. And depolarization is when the neuron becomes slightly less negative, so it gets closer to neutral. So scientists have investigated what happens when they add stimulation to a cell causing either hyperpolarization or depolarization. And what they found is that, um, by and large, you have a graded response. That means the greater the stimulation, the greater the response in turn um, to the resting potential. So the more you stimulate it, the more effect you get. However, um, this all actually changes once you hit, once you get the neuron to depolarize to roughly negative 40 millivolts. The threshold for each cell differs by an average about negative 40 millivolts. So we're going to use that for the sake of our, um, our examples. So when you get to this threshold, that's where an action potential occurs. And we'll talk about why that is. But it's, um, it sets off a cascade of events. Um, a domino of events um, that leads to the signal being propagated down the axon. So there are a couple of few important facts that we need to note. First, this is no longer a graded response. So when I'm depolarizing the cell below that negative 40, so it's staying more negative than the negative 40. Um, the response is directly equivalent to the amount of excitement that I'm adding. Once it hits negative 40, it's not graded. It's an all or nothing event, uh, which means that the neuron fires either at full amplitude or not at all. So an example of this, um, for whatever reason, this seems to be the best example people come up with, is a toilet. So when you flush the toilet, you can't do a light flush of the toilet, really, or a heavy flush of the toilet. You either flush the toilet or you don't flush the toilet. Action potentials are kind of the same way. You know, once you hit the threshold, once you push down hard enough on that lever, that toilet's going to flush. It's going to flush the same way as if you really jam the lever down or you press it just hard enough to get it to go. So that's what it means by all or nothing, is once it fires, it fires at full amplitude and yeah, you know, it doesn't change anything with that. Now, what you will see is if there's a lot of stimulation, instead of having greater amplitude, you'll have greater frequency. 
So you'll see um, action potentials happening more often than when there's less stimulation. Um, we will also discuss after potentials here in a bit, but what I want you to know at this point is that there are changes in the cell's charge that result in hyperpolarization after an action potential. And you'll see why that's important in just a little bit.